This is a Neko Media Podcast. What's your pleasure, sir? show cinephiles and cenobites to a new cinebite number 47 i'm your host with the most annika p today we have the wonderful juliet miranda on the show she is host of the unwritable rant podcast and author of the book morning neurosis the mostly true story of a girl trying to reconcile her rock and roll roots with a new reality Mox and Ono ask her about podcasting, writing, her influences, and her choice of drink. It's bourbon. It was a great talk and good time getting to know Julia and her wife. Shout out and thanks to to producer Dave for the setup and recording. Here it is, our chat with Juliet Miranda on this segment, Schrody's Ladder. All right, well, welcome to this uh, Schrody's Ladder. Today on the show, we have a guest podcaster, writer, Juliet Miranda. Thank you for joining us, Juliet. Hey, y'all. Great to be here. All right, yeah, so feel free to um, introduce yourself and um, kind of give listeners uh, some background on your work. Sure. Well, I am the host of the Unwritable Rant podcast. And I am also an author. My first book came out a few years ago. It's called Morning Neurosis. And I am also a very, very enthusiastic bourbon drinker. <laughs> right on. Do you have any bourbon right now? <laughs> I always have bourbon. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm, drinking, I'm drinking a hot toddy right now, which is lemon, hot water, uh, a little bit of honey, and a whole lot of bourbon. Oh, okay. Oh. Oh, sounds great. I'm a, I'm a rock star guy right now, so shout out to rock star. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm usually a vodka, but I am not today. Not not today. Right on. <laughs> so I guess uh, we'll, we'll just get started. Um, I understand you have some exciting news that you guys just picked up a new sponsor, Studio. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we did. It was really exciting. They actually reached out to us. And wow. said that they were fans of the podcast and thought that we might be able to have a, a great collaboration together. So uh, did a little bit of research and they sent us some product. And I got to say, Studio is amazing. It's a premium headphone company and they're out of wow. Sweden of all places. And they really, it's like, it's like the perfect combination of technology and just beautiful design. I mean, they're they're gorgeous headphones. I'm in love with them. So I, I was really, really hesitant at all to have a sponsorship for the podcast because I'm really particular. But when I got my hands on the product, I was just, I was excited. It worked out. Have um, other, I guess, sponsors contacted you before, you know, with like bogus products or products you're not into and you're trying to get attached to the unwritable rent? Yes, uh, we've started getting more requests like that. And I mean, I'm always happy to check them out, but it's got to be for me, if I'm going to devote, you know, time on the show to talk about something, it's got to be something that I love. Ah. Mm. Something that you would actually use yourself. Well, yeah, I mean, and I know headphones, you know, they're not exactly the sexiest thing on the planet, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, know. for me, These I'm pretty sexy. <laughs> well, yeah, and these are like super sexy headphones, and I'm such a princess when it comes to this kind of thing anyway, so if they're not awesome, I'm not going to wear them. Uh, so I was just, I was blown away when I got these on. Oh, are they, are they uh, for like, you know, listening to your jams, or are they for like podcasting headphones, or they have like a whole spectrum? They have a whole line, and it's professional quality, uh, and it really focuses on perfect sound and perfect design so these are like aerodynamic headphones you know they're they're perfectly situated they have a uh, bluetooth technology they're just they're perfect awesome so what does what exactly does a sponsorship entail like um do you have to plug it uh, every show or is there a certain amount of time you have to do? do you have to wear their products you know at live 
appearances? Well, I would imagine it varies for everybody, but what we're doing is uh, for a couple of episodes, I'm just going to be talking about them, you know, here and there, just so that it's kind of like an organic insertion into the show and it doesn't feel like an ad. Um, um, you know, we'll see how it goes from there. Well, that sounds cool. Not too intrusive. Not like this message brought to you by studio. Right. Yeah, no, I didn't. Well, I definitely don't want to do that. And I really don't like it. There are a lot of uh, ad services that will actually automatically place ads within your show and you have no control over what they are. So I definitely didn't want to do that with this. It just, it kind of feels organic. Hmm. Nice. Also, I hear later in the year, you are going to something called the Pot and Love Convention. Uh, ah, please. yeah. Can you tell us what that is and how you got involved with it? Absolutely. I'm really excited about it because it's taking place in New Orleans in the second week of August. And I'm just, I'm a huge New Orleans fan to begin with. Just, it's my favorite place in the country. So when they approached me, you know, they didn't really have to sell it that hard because I'm like, New Orleans, I'm there. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But Potter and Love is actually an extension of the podcasts we listen to group on Facebook. And this is thousands upon thousands of people who hang out and talk about their favorite podcasts. So this convention is essentially by podcast fans for podcast fans. And it's meant to be a really intimate way to, you know, get to know shows that you love, hang out with hosts that you enjoy, uh, you know, really just kind of hang out with everybody who's got a similar, you know, mindset that you do. Cool. It's kind of crazy. So it's like a convention, like podcast con. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. Yes. That's awesome. I, you know, until, uh, we started podcasting, I didn't even realize how huge podcasting itself is. I mean, now that we're doing it, I feel like everybody has a podcast, you know? It's like, like, listen to my show too. Oh, thanks. Exactly. That's the funny thing. I mean, it's it's huge, but it's also incredibly intimate. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. I'd like to talk more on that later, the intimacy of it. Um, so how did you become an author? Uh, because you started out in the music industry, and it seems like the jump into the literary seems huge. It's a curse. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no. A blessing. Uh, no, I've no. been, uh, you know, it goes both ways. <laughs> um, I've been a writer since birth, pretty much. And I've always been a music fan at the same time. So writing was really my gateway into the music scene because it gave me a way to talk about what I loved. So I started off as a rock writer and, you know, I did interviews and I worked for a lot of regional magazines and newspapers. And that's kind of what led me to the point where I was ready to write a book was because I had all these crazy stories about my experiences working in the music industry. And that was uh, mostly during your time in L.A., right? Is yeah, that kind of the hub of where you would be to be in the scene and write about rock and roll. Well, I did it both in Chicago and in Los Angeles. And at the time, it was just it worked out well because I was writing about a lot of hair bands. And that was really where they all you know, came from and where they went back to was the Los Angeles you know, Sunset Strip scene. So it was the right place for me to be. Nice. Um, can I ask, if you don't mind, um, like who were the top? let's say five bands at the time you're writing or working in the uh, music well, industry. Talk, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who's on the radio? Well, top um, top 40. <laughs> um, I'd say Bon Jovi was definitely at the top of the charts. Uh, oh, probably yeah. Def Leppard, hmm. um, yeah. Poison, you know, bands like that. Oh, okay. Okay. Right on. Like full blown hair metal. Okay. Oh yeah. It was, it was all about the hair. The hair. Nice. <laughs> so, um, you know, when I hear that rock writing, I almost famous comes to mind. Was it uh, that kind of odyssey, you know, <laughs> on the on on the bus with you know, obviously not Tiny Dancer, but you know, <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the the jams of the eighties. You know, you actually nailed it because my life was so similar to Almost Famous. I mean, I started writing <laughs> about rock bands when I was fifteen. You know, and, and I was I was going to concerts and I was, you know, talking my way onto tour buses when I was just a kid. I mean, that that movie was truly my life only, you know, set in 
the hairband scene as opposed to, you know, the 70s scene. Right, right. Yeah, I think I remember something from Morning Neurosis. Uh, you recalled back to when you used to write about uh, Bon Jovi and you wanted to, like, recapture that feeling again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, well, that was really what started it for me was the feeling that you get when you listen to a really great song. You know, you get that energy and you get that passion. And I wanted to give that to other people in my own way. And since I'm not a musician, but I am a writer, that mm -hmm. was the way that I thought that I could share, you know, that, that energy with people. Oh, that's definitely a huge way. So, um, I guess next, obviously not everyone's life merits a book, but how would you recommend, or I guess, what's your approach for taking the source material, which I guess would be someone's life and then crafting it into a narrative? Well, it, it all comes down to storytelling, really. I mean, you have to know what your point is, you know, and, and you have to know who your characters are and you have to build an adventure for them. So, you know, there has to be this arc to it where, you know, your character is going through something and then they're going to come out at the end, you know, one way or another. It doesn't necessarily matter if, you know, you're that fascinating of a person. It's about developing a fascinating story. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, that's definitely a key. You do not have to be that interesting, but the <laughs> shit that you get into has to be interesting. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's it's like the difference between an anecdote and a story. You know, you can walk right. into a bar and, you know, there could be a screaming child next to you, but that doesn't really make a story. The story <laughs> is everything that happens around. <laughs> right, right. That's exactly what I was thinking. Like, you know, for say someone keeps a journal, you know, but they want to write a book. I guess, how do they craft it into something that is a story as opposed to, you know, May 19th, I woke up sick and ate a donut and that made me sicker. Right, right. Well, and, and again, it's like the difference between blogging and writing a book. You know, blogging is just sort of this this verbal vomit, you know, whereas for a book <laughs> you have <laughs> you have a point. Verbal yeah. vomit. Nice. Okay. So yeah, I guess like with everything with writing, it always comes back to story. Story, story, story. Always. So uh, it has been said on testimonials, and I agree, you know, your writing and your show feels super honest, warts and all, and the tone feels something personal with a friend. Is that what you were going for? Um, did you? Well, thank you practice? for saying that. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to go for. Um, that's, that's why I write about myself is because I know myself really well, and that's how I can make it something that people will be interested in is because I know how to tell my story and I know how to talk about these, these weird and crazy adventures that I have. Um, and I, I want people to feel like they're being welcomed into my life. And that's, that's kind of why I incorporate the bourbon into my podcast is because I like the idea of just sitting down with someone at a bar and telling them, you know, the, the crazy adventure you had the night before. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. I never even thought about that. That, that is probably why it feels like <laughs> you're just chilling out with a homie who's telling you this crazy shit happened. Check it out. Right, right. Yeah, it's it's like hanging out with a friend, you know, I, and that's that's what I'm hoping for. That's what I like to do. So um, I guess on that note, how would a potential writer create that kind of intimacy with their with their reader? You know, how would they get their words to the hearts of their audience? How do you well, it comes, you do it? it's, it's a really hard balance because it comes down to honesty and being open with what you're feeling and what you're seeing. You know, you, you have to develop a scene. So you can't just say, I'm sitting in a bar. You know, you have to say, I'm sitting in a bar and I smell, you know, feet or, you know, talk about the sounds that are behind you. You know, you need to create an atmosphere that's going to welcome welcome somebody into it, you know, and from there, you can kind of guide them into something that you want them to know about. Yeah. So definitely atmosphere is 
a heavy part of getting them or building that, I guess, closeness or connection? Absolutely. I mean, and, and again, you have to be really open and honest with people. And even for me, I mean, that's in the past, it has caused a little bit of problems. So you have to, <laughs> you have to walk this <laughs> fine line of, of careful, carefully curating a story for somebody where you're not revealing too many intimate details. Because with my book, I got into a little bit of trouble just with, you know, people that I was talking about. I hadn't entirely concealed their identities the way I should have. So, you know, it's it's this balance of creating a character that people are going to respond to without making it too real where people identify them too closely. So, so people actually, they read it and they're like, oh, my God, that's me. I'm on blast. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's why I'm really careful with the podcast when I talk about people that I've been with uh, to really conceal their identities. And and in that respect, you know, I change the timelines of my story. You know, I, I, I conceal things and I make sure that when I'm talking about somebody that I really did know, it's not going to come back to them. You know, they're, they're not going to necessarily know that I'm talking about them, but they're all people that I, you know, have had in my life before. I want, I wondered about that because, I mean, you don't give away any names or identities, but some of these characters are so specific. I'm like, you know, how much of that <laughs> is real? Because I feel they are so specific. If it were me and I was listening, I'd be like, oh my God, that is anyone who knows me would know that's me. Right. Well, and I, I do have that issue. Certain people know that they are in the podcast and they are okay with it. Uh, I mean, for example, my guy, my husband, um, I, do, I obviously don't name him, but anybody who knows me knows that my guy is clearly, you know, my husband. So there's only so much I can do to conceal him. But I do conceal identities about our life that would give away who he is, say, professionally speaking with his job. You know, there's, there's just ways mm -hmm. of kind of skirting the issue. Does that ever become a point of controversy between you and your guy? Um, what to tell or what? I guess, even if you make up something, the fact that there are people who know who you're referring to, it, does, is that ever a good point of contention? Not at all. No. I mean, he trusts me entirely. And he knows that I have a very, very high level of ethics that I'm not going to reveal anything. And if, if I do have a story in mind, and I feel like maybe it's crossing the line, then I will go to him in advance and say, here's what I'm thinking about talking about. Are you okay with that? You know, we, we have such a great relationship that we have this, we're very conversational in how we talk about things. So, you know, he, he understands where I'm coming from. And, you know, he's, he's okay with it. That's awesome. I mean, I, I definitely think that is important because of the nature of your work for him, you know, for you guys to have the kind of open understanding dynamic. Oh, yeah. I could never do this if I didn't have his support. I, I mean, especially in that respect. I mean, uh, my guy is also my producer. So, you know, we oh. work on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Not everybody knows that, but uh, he is <laughs> I mean, also my producer. So we no, have a very <laughs> close relationship. <laughs> I feel like that should have been obvious, but that, wow, okay, cool. <laughs> what up? Mind blown, I know. <laughs> Mine is blown. Oh, okay. Shit, I had a, the next question I was going to, okay. <laughs> Did you always know that you would eventually maybe not get to morning neurosis, but you were always going to be an author? I don't know if I necessarily knew I was going to be an author. I knew that I was going to do something with myself. I knew that I had stories that needed to be out there. So I, my initial goal was actually to be a host on MTV. That was what I wanted. I went to school. I got a nice. degree in communications and media production. And my plan was, that's why I went out to, to Los Angeles, was so that I could work at MTV. And when that didn't work out, you know, I fell back on the rock writing because that was always there. And it was something that I was very good at. Um, so once I had, once I started compiling these experiences and I had the book, you know, I, I knew that there was more for me. And I moved on to podcasting because I think it's pretty obvious now that media is changing. People don't read as much as they used to. You know, yeah. books really aren't a thing. 
So I wanted to tell my stories and I decided, well, if I can't do it in the traditional manner, then I'm going to find a new way to do it. Nice. That's cool that, you know, you're able to pivot into the now, but still keep the essence, I guess, of what it is that you want to do. You know, you want to tell stories and from a personal point of view. Yeah, you really got to be flexible. I mean, whatever you do in life, I mean, you need to have the understanding that it's not necessarily going to work out the way you want it to. <laughs> so, you know, you, you have to be able to pivot. You have to be able to, you know, bend the rules a little bit to make yourself, you know, what you want to be. Going back to your initial goal of being a VJ, I think that's so cool. And I think you would have been awesome. How how big of a setback or a letdown was it when that became apparent that that wasn't going to happen? <clears throat> <laughs> uh, it, it sucked. It really did. I mean, I, I did so many auditions. I actually hosted a series of infomercials out in Los Angeles, oh. which oh. <laughs> is not a stellar portion of my resume <laughs> in any respect. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you, you go on these auditions, you know, I was an extra in a bunch of movies and other things and, on, you know, TV shows. It was brutal. I hated it. I, I hated the critique of myself you know I mean there are things that I can control and things that I can't you know I, I look a certain way and you know that wasn't what they were looking for so I was so frustrated with that I'm like well you know what just forget this you know I'm I'm a writer I write well I'm great at it this is going to be have to be you know, the way that I express myself right right can I ask is it is our auditions like how they're sometimes sometimes portrayed in films like it's a meat market and they just don't give a fuck about your feelings or your time you wait eight hours and they give you 30 seconds like thank you it's worse oh, <laughs> really? no. i mean oh. it, it's, it's truly worse everything that you've heard about you know work about being an actress in you know in hollywood is true and it's even oh. more true in other fields i mean even being a, a rock writer in the music scene it's it's not easy. You know, you, you put up with a lot of bad behavior from people. Do you feel, you know, in light of the recent, um, I don't know if expose is the right word, but, you know, the recent, I guess, whistleblowing and the, the movements, do you think it's uh, any easier now for women in those types of fields? I don't think it's going to ever be easy. Um, I think it's great and I think it's incredibly positive that women are gaining more control and that we're able to, you know, speak about the things that have happened. I think that's amazing and it's a huge step forward, but, you know, it, it's really about continuing it to have that control and to have equal footing. And I think we have a long way to go before that happens. I, I definitely think so too. The <laughs> shit is just so askew. But yeah, I sorry, I, not to get political, but if I just <laughs> no, no, it's all right. Because of the second mind blown, damn. So everybody listening, <laughs> what you saw in the movies, it's worse. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Oh, man, man. So like, does not to say there aren't good people out there too, no, and there aren't good right, experiences. Right. I mean, I've had both. You know it. It just, it, it varies for everybody. So you really just cannot have humongous insecurity issues, I guess, right? I mean, you just got to take it with, I don't know, a grain of salt and be like, all right, they didn't want my look or whatever, nothing personal, on to the next. Oh, yeah. I mean, and that goes for any creative field, really. I mean, especially even as a writer, you know, you go through so many rejections until you get that one that if if you have any sensitivity about it whatsoever, it will break you. Shit, how do you get over it? I guess you just get a little numb to it because I'm, you know, pretty sensitive to criticism, at least at first. After a good cry there, then, you know, I'm willing to. <laughs> to after a shower, you know, I'm done. <laughs> it's like iTunes reviews, you know? I mean, you you get a bad iTunes review about a podcast and you're like, oh, oh, it, I mean, it, it you know, kind of ruins your day, but you really have to take it in stride. You know, I, the first bad review that I ever got, and that was for my book, 
I actually had it printed on a coffee mug. Oh, wow. Kind of like and, that. Uh, you know, it, it, it was empowering. I'm like, this person read my book. You know, and and now they had such a visceral reaction to it. They had to say something awful about it. And I just I took it in stride. And that's that's all you can do. You have to embrace it because the only thing you can control is how you respond to something. True. I guess that part is empowering what you can control. Also, I like that you looked at the point. Yeah. One, they read your work Two, it hit them on an emotional level. It it was <laughs> occupying their mind that they had to blast it out and be like, "I thought this, this, and that." Exactly. Yeah. Oh, so you have coined it here on our show, the coffee mug solution. I'm gonna do that too. <laughs> you face next it every negative day. Negative thing. <laughs> yep. Next negative thing, I am putting it on a mug or shirt. I recommend it. I do. Excellent coffee mug. Got it. Okay, let's see. Okay, um, so what kind of books do you read? Well, I tend to prefer the classics. Um, there, there are actually very few modern writers that I really, truly enjoy. So when I'm uh, just reading for pleasure, I usually go back and, you know, reread my favorites. Like when you say classics, do you mean like, Ulysses, War and Peace kind of classic. <laughs> Charles Dickens. Well, sort of. I mean, in, in a way, yeah. I mean, my favorite writers are Ernest Hemingway, Charles Bukowski, and Scott Fitzgerald. So, you know, mm. right now I'm rereading The Sun Also Rises by Hemingway because I love the writing and I continually find little pieces of, you know, just dialogue or descriptions in there that inspire me. I think I tried reading uh, Sun Also Rises. It's very short, right? It's a very small book. It's, it's very concise, yeah. Somewhere in France, maybe, or a, it's a European setting? Paris, yep. Paris? Okay, cool. I don't know. I A lot of them didn't speak to me. I tried to read um, Fitzgerald's uh, famous book, but that was a little heavy for me and huge. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's... I tell everybody, don't trust how you felt about the book when you read it in school, you know, because oh. reading a book in school is is really not fun for anybody because you have to look at it in an entirely different way. You have to be critical and analytical. You're not reading for pleasure. So if you grab one of those books now, like if you grab the great if you grab the great Gatsby now, you're going to read it and it's going to be entirely different and you might find you really enjoy it. All right, I am going to give that a try because if I do, I will feel a lot better about myself. <laughs> Don't let it get you down, I swear. <laughs> who can enjoy the classics. Okay, so definitely. Uh, let's see. You like the classics. And I guess you kind of touched on what authors inspire you. Hemingway, Fitzgerald. And Bukowski. Yeah, that, Bukowski. it's like my perfect trifecta. You know, I, I like them all for very specific reasons, and they all influence me in very specific ways. Do uh, you mind touching on on that a little bit? That was yeah, not at all. Uh, well, just like what we were saying about Hemingway, his writing he's he tells amazing stories in this very concise way. You know, and then you know you look at somebody like Scott Fitzgerald and The Great Gatsby, and he has this incredible lyrical sort of technique. And then you've got Charles Bukowski, and he's just so raw and real and vivid. And those are the the three things that really I want my work and my storytelling to reflect. You know, I, I want it to be direct and concise, but, you know, I, I want it to be real. And I want people to feel it. Oh, that is dope. That is a trifecta if you're taking... It is. Well, for me, it is. I mean, I'm sure every every writer has, you know, their own personal blend of people who inspire them but those those are mine i like that i remember one thing um i don't know what i was reading i think it was a screenwriting how to the 85th one i probably read but they're talking about um hemingway and uh his uh concise and brevity and they call it something like a uh, frame line magnetism and uh he wrote i guess i don't know if it was an advertisement but it went something like this uh brand new baby shoes for sale 
never worn. Oh, then, I've heard that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And at first I was like, okay. And then I was like, oh, okay. Oh, man, Israel. That's sad. Right. You, you get it. Friend. You get it. In two sentences, he's told a story that makes you feel something. Oh, man. So, yeah, definitely. Okay, I can see why that why that inspires you. Um, well, I guess we kind of touched on your favorite books. Uh, you want to give, I guess, one from each of those authors? Sure. Um, Charles Bukowski is absolutely the book of women. It's about Los Angeles in the 60s, and it's about him being a drunk. It's just so... Cool. Yeah. I mean, if if you read nobody else that I've suggested, go for Charles Bukowski because he's he's just a very simple writer and he was inspired by Hemingway, too. Um, his writing is just so cool and vivid. It's it's amazing. OK, I might check that out. Women, you said, is the title. That's the one. Nice. Right. I kind of like uh, Hemingway's backstory, too, is a hard drinker. He's like a soldier, boxer. It's like, damn, no wonder that dude wrote. Yeah, I mean, he was he was a true, you know, hearty guy, and his words were just so perfect. You know, he he knew how to tell these stories that were, you know, incredibly deep without being needlessly wordy. Hmm. So, a favorite from Mr. Hemingway. Um. It dep- I guess it depends on my mood. I <laughs> love Sun Also Rises. It's definitely, it's definitely one of my favorites. But I also love Movable Feast, which he wrote towards the end of his life. And that's actually more of a memoir than it is an actual novel because he's talking about the time that he spent in Paris and about what it was like to write The Sun Also Rises. Oh. So it's just, it's an interesting book. It's, it's probably not his best writing. Mm-hmm. But I like the way that he wrote it. Okay, cool. And uh, Fitzgerald? Well, Gatsby is definitely, uh, you know, a, a classic and it's everybody knows it. But he actually has this very small collection of observations called On Drinking. And it's a series wow. of little vignettes about travel and hotels that he stayed at and it's just a really cool insightful piece of work and it's very incomplete i mean these are these are very uh you know open-ended just kind of stream of consciousness sort of things but it really gives an insight into who he was and he just he comes up with such cool ways of saying things it's just it's it's musical oh man i kind of want to check out all three of those books now (laughs) You should. They'll change your life. They did mine. Okay. So um, is there a book or a text that helps center or focus you, you know, when shit slash life spins out? Would it be one of those three? Or is there another one that's kind of like your go-to centering? I don't know if I really have anything that does that. Um, you know, if, if I need to clear my head, you know, if, if I'm struggling with coming up with a story or if things just aren't coming together with a podcast, usually what I do is cook because I don't, I, I'm trying to escape the fact that there's something that's blocked in my head. So I need to do something entirely different than what that is. So I will spend, you know, three hours in the kitchen chopping vegetables and sauteing (laughs) and cooking and making food. And it, it, it allows my brain to just kind of open up a little bit. And then you know, as it does, then I can kind of put the pieces back together. Okay. Step away, do something else. Okay. Exactly. Like, You'll drive yeah. yourself crazy if you stare at a blank screen. You know, if if you if nothing <laughs> is coming, you know, you, you can't get that song or those words or whatever it is, just walk away for a little while. Okay. I like that. Or else you'll end up all work, no play makes Jack a dull boy. Right, yeah, and then that's not going to end well at all for anybody. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Frozen in a labyrinth. So, are there any habits that you personally recommend for writing, as far as you know, getting shit done? Well, I think with writing, like anything, 
you constantly need to be doing it in order to keep, you know, your, your muscles in tune. You know, it, you can't step away from it for a month or two months and then come back to it and expect to be at the same level you were when you left off. You know, if, if you're not writing something every day, then, you know, you're not really using your full potential. So even if you just, you know, put a couple of sentences down on page, if you outline something, you know, you've, you've always got to be doing it. Okay. Stay busy, getting busy. I like that. <laughs> just whatever it is I mean, you it, do. It's, yeah, it, it's hard. I mean, with podcasting and the way that I work the podcast, you know, I, I tell two stories every episode. And these two stories, you know, I, I outline really rigorously before I go into telling them. Um, I find that when I'm, you know, when I have an interview episode, say, where I'm interviewing a celebrity or uh, if I have a week off, I find that it's really hard to get back into the swing of, you know, coming up with content on a regular basis. So I don't like to take breaks because they actually do me more harm than good. So, okay, that's interesting. You don't ever uh, full stop. Even on a break, you're keeping uh, sharp with something. And Exactly. I mean, unless I am on vacation, if I am on a very specific vacation, <laughs> then I do stop there. You know, I, I truly believe you need to take that time for yourself. But, you know, it, like I'm not going to just blow off a week, uh, you know, if, if I don't feel like podcasting or if I can't, you know, come up with two stories in time, I'm not going to blow it off. You know, I, I want to make sure that I keep myself in that groove. Would you say that something that separates uh, amateurs and professionals? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you really need to treat podcasting, especially as though it's a business. You know, this has to be your career, so to speak, because, you know, like we were saying earlier, there are so many podcasts out there. You know, you need to be able to differentiate yourself. And that starts with treating it professionally. Mm, okay. Got it. Even so, if you got to pull an all-nighter editing. <laughs> Get it out on Monday. <laughs> Get it out on Monday. All right. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I work my producer slash husband very hard. <laughs> no sleep for yep. you. All right. <laughs> the producers have a huge workload, so I'll definitely ask you to uh, detail that a little later. <laughs> sure. Um, so I was going to ask how you stay on track to make sure that you get uh, stuff done so that you have, I guess, a product to take to the next level. But um, I, I feel like maybe you kind of touched on that. Staying busy. Well, I can, yeah, okay. it's, I have a very specific routine. Uh, that I follow in order to develop content because uh, the podcast publishes on uh, uh, Sunday mornings. And in order to get to that point where I have a product to put out, I spend, you know, Monday through Saturday creating content, you know, whether I'm working out ideas, whether I'm outlining them, uh, you know, or even I do a lot of talking loud. Uh, you know, my, my guy will find me walking up and down the hallways talking to myself because that's how I work out my story ideas to make sure that they sound, you know, conversational. So, you know, Monday I sit down, I start outlining different ideas, you know, Tuesday I flesh them out and it just keeps going from there until I'm ready to record, which, you know, knock on wood is Thursday night. Hmm. That is interesting, and that's kind of what I thought. I was going to ask that later when we got to podcasting, but even a once-a-week thing is still an everyday job. You're working at it to get that Absolutely. thing out. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, you really have to work on it every single day to make sure that you've got something people want to listen to. Okay, question on that. Yeah, How do you arrive at what you think people might want to listen, at, uh, listen, at, listen to? I drink a lot of bourbon and I cross my fingers. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, no, you know, it, it really, again, it comes back down to those stories. You know, I, I take a look at, you know, my life and the, the things that I've done and, you know, I'll, I'll talk about them with my guy or, you know, with my friends. 
And I know that if I see them listening to me and if I see them engaged, that I know I have something there that I can build off of. Okay. So you definitely have kind of your own little test audience to see if it is connecting outside of internally. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it, it's it's like anything. You just you kind of have to talk it out until you get to a point where you're comfortable with it and you feel like you've got that that right you know material. Was that the same process for uh, morning neurosis? No. Well, actually, I think it may have been because the book didn't actually start out as a book. It started out as a string of emails. Oh, oh wow. Yeah, it, it was before blogging was a thing. And I was in this awful relationship with this guy that, you know, I, I was constantly just freaking out about everything because it was just a bad relationship. So I started writing these really long winded emails to my friends. And, you know, for whatever reason, they thought they were funny or, you know, interesting or whatever. So a couple of my friends forwarded them on to their friends. And the next thing I know, I've got people, you know, across the country that I've never met sending me emails going, hey, you know, what happened after, you know, your date the other night? So, oh. you know, I, I, yeah, it was crazy. And I'd be like, who are you again? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I thought, wow, OK, you know, if, if they're responding to these emails, maybe I have a, a you know, a story to tell here. And I kind of took the framework of those initially emails and used that to develop the book. I think definitely that's a great sign, you know, I mean, when people you don't know are contacting you, be like, hey, I liked your stuff. Also, what happened next? Right, <laughs> right. Well, and right. that's the coolest thing about the podcast is, you know, I've created some of these characters and I tell these stories and it, it's so cool when, you know, somebody will, you know, hit me up on Twitter or wherever and, you know, ask me a question about it or be like, when are you going to talk about, you know, crazy town again or. You know, <laughs> what happened, you know, when you were out last weekend? You know, I, I want to know before it hits the podcast. Nice. Now, uh, for the book, uh, when you finished the first draft, after you had kind of realized that it should be a book, uh, what was the, the process or where did you go from there? Did you have it? Uh, did you just send it out or did you edit it yourself? Did you have it covered? I did a lot of the initial editing myself, um, which may not have been the best decision, but I didn't really know any different. And I took that final product and I just started sending it out until I found the right publisher for it. And, you know, from there, I worked with a publisher's editor and uh, that was a grueling experience just having somebody else, you know, look at your work and say, no, nope, no, nope, you need to change that. You know, it's it's incredibly challenging when you've got that product that you love and you think is perfect. You know, you've got somebody saying, well, it's not quite as perfect as you think. Hmm. How does that land? Uh, do you have to, is there a compromise or they say this goes or change this and you kind of just have to figure out a way to do that? A very good editor knows how to shape a story. So that's what they try to do. They're not trying to ruthlessly, a good editor will not try to ruthlessly cut your work apart, but instead she will, you know, guide your story. It's not about using different words. It's about building something that has a better arc or a better, you know, better conclusion, something that people are going to be more interested in. Um, and that was the real learning curve for me was that I hadn't realized what it meant necessarily to tell a story like that. So the very first version of my book, um, it, it didn't necessarily have the same narrative. Um, I thought that I could just tell a couple of disjointed anecdotes uh, <laughs> and working with the editor helped me kind of bridge together a little bit more about, you know, the relationship and so on. Well, thanks for touching on that because that uh, helps deepen my understanding of what an editor is um, and how crucial they are. I was thinking, you know, they're basically there checking for words, grammar, a better way to phrase this, cut this, cut that. But no, that's more... that's actually a proofreader. A proofreader is the one who will say, no, you need a comma there. You know, you, you need quote marks there. An editor is somebody who shapes your story. Oh, I like that. Kind of how a producer might help shape your sound. Absolutely. Yeah, that's very similar. Oh. 
Yeah, they're not going to cool. write your song for you, but they are going to tell you how to get it to that right place. <laughs> Thus, the importance of finding the right editor for your work. <laughs> exactly. Cool. Okay. So you wouldn't necessarily recommend how you did, which was uh, after you have your first draft, be your be your own, I guess, editor. Well, you know, it depends on where you are as a writer. A strong writer doesn't necessarily, you know, if, if you've done this a lot, you know, you don't necessarily need that guidance initially. For me, it was the first long form piece of work I'd ever put together. So, you know, an editor was huge for me. Um, but I mean, it varies from person to person. I don't think there's one set way that you can say will work for everybody. Okay, definitely not one size fits all. Or, um, I thought I read something on the site about a second book. I do have Is two other one? books in the works. Yeah. I, I don't focus on them as much as I could only because the podcast takes up all of my energy. Right. You know, and, and as I was saying before, too, people aren't reading. <laughs> it, it's unfortunate. It kind of sucks. But, you yeah. know, if I'm going to tell my stories, I'm going to do it in a way people are going to listen. <laughs> Give me the audio tape, audio format. Right, right. Well, I mean, think about it. You know, who even buys a newspaper anymore or, you know, a, a big magazine? It just doesn't happen. That's true. It's true. Mm, that's true. Print is pretty much dead. It's definitely gasping for life. So, you know, I, I can't I can't put all of my energy into something that may not exist 10 years from now. Huh. That's definitely something to consider. That, I guess, plays to the next thing I was going to ask. Do you consider commercial appeal or, you know, viability at all when you're writing or crafting? Or is it kind of an afterthought? Well, I think it has to be an afterthought. I mean, it has to be about the act of creation. You know, you, you have to want to put something out there, whatever it is, if it's a book, a podcast, you know, a, a piece of music, it's got to be about that, you know, doing what you want to do and getting it done. And then when you have something to sell, then you can start the process of finding out how to do that. Ooh, okay. Do you feel it is harder to get started or to keep going? For me personally, it's harder to get started. Because it's that coming up with the idea, you know, it's, it's trying to figure out what you want to talk about. But once I know that, once I have a general idea, the writing process just happens. That's interesting. So for you, the idea generation is harder than the actual seeing it through to fruition. Absolutely. Yeah. Because, you know, the, the word I write all the time. So I know how to tell a story. It's finding the right story to tell. That's the challenge. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know if this is plays into the uh, cooking thing, but when inspiration is waning or you feel uh, sapped creatively, how do you reinvigorate? Would that be cooking? Yeah, I absolutely just step away from, you know, the project and I try to just kind of open up myself to other ideas, you know, and sitting there and doing something menial like chopping vegetables, it allows your mind to wander a little bit, you know, you, you don't have that laser focus that you would if you're sitting in front of your computer, you know, it allows you to just kind of get loose and let things happen. And uh, yeah, I absolutely will always head right into the kitchen if I'm feeling blocked. How do you know when it's time to head to the kitchen versus you're close enough to push through? Ernest Hemingway actually had a bit of advice for a young writer that I carry with me always. And he always said, stop when you know how you want to finish. So you might be agonizing over, you know, a sentence or a transition, but you know where you want to go. So just pause there, you know, put it away for the day and then come back to it in the morning. And that's always worked for me. Okay. I like that. I will remember that. Yeah. Nice. Know where you're going. Take a break. Yes, did exactly. He say, oh, uh, did he say why it might be counterproductive to keep going? You know, you got where you're going to go. Why not just try and get there already? 
Hemingway believed that the well would run dry if you did that. Oh, okay. His idea was that you always keep a little bit of juice left over, you know, and then the process of getting to the finish will help you refill the tank to go on to the next piece. Cool. Um, okay. More on podcasting. Did you go through uh, many or any iterations of uh, the Unwritable Rants format before you kind of uh, struck what worked now? Well, you know, they say that it takes like seven to 10 podcast episodes to really find your footing. Um, for me, I think it took more like 20. <laughs> um, you know, I, I really, I had a different sort of mindset when I got started with the podcast because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with it. I wasn't sure if I wanted to just use it to, you know, talk about things that annoyed me or talk about movies that I liked. Um, you know, so the very first couple of episodes are incredibly different than the ones that are, you know, the current ones. It took me, you know, it, up until like 20, 25 episodes to really figure out that I could use this format to tell stories. Okay, cool. That's kind of yeah, what I was wondering. So you were kind of finding your way and then you found it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it just it, it like anything, you know, it's trial and error. Yeah, I think we're still trialing. <laughs> yeah, so. we're, 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 we are pro and con. Troubleshooting, it. we still don't know. We haven't found the footing yet. <laughs> but are you having fun? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, well, there you go. That's great. So reinvigorated uh, this new year, yeah. There was a lull a bit, but I think keeping trying to keep things fresh helps to stay passionate. Um, so how long did it take before you, you kind of experienced traction with the podcast, you know, before you realized you had regular listeners and you were interacting with them? It took, a, it, it probably took, I'd say about six months or so. And I really noticed the change when I got involved with the Potter and family on Twitter. Uh, Potter and family is kind of a collection of other podcasters and it's this you know group of people who just kind of listen to each other's podcasts and share them you know it's just it's like a supportive sort of community and the second I found them and started you know listening to their podcasts um, it, it was truly like building my own podcast family because I met these amazing people who are so talented and good at what they do and very free with offering advice whenever we needed help with something you know, it was getting connected with them that I think was the big turning point in developing the show and building an audience was, you know, just the assistance that we got from them. Okay, cool. Um, so do you feel it's a question of um, marketing and branding at that point? You know, once you kind of hooked up with the Potter family and got involved, well, you know, you need to have a product, so to speak. You know, you, you need to have a concept. You know, for me, it's storytelling. For another podcast, it might be, you know, movie reviews or something like that. So you, you need to be able to sell it and you need to know how to talk about it. But I think one of the cool things about podcasting is that it's also about building relationships and making friends. Okay. That is definitely a big part of your success what do you attribute to it well it, it had a lot to do with it you know you you need to it, it's kind of like tribal marketing where you know it takes a village so you know if you support other people you know you you work with them then they're going to be inclined to you know return the favor it's it's about making you know great relationships with people and then you know from there it just kind of happens organically where you know, other people start hearing about it and it just starts bridging out to other tribes. Oh, definitely very true. That's actually how we found out about the Unwritable Rant. Someone uh, retweeted it and the, <laughs> I like the way you describe your shows. <laughs> <laughs> I love writing those descriptions. I have the best time with those. So, um, 
how long was it before you met your producer? Or he kind of was with you when you decided, you know what, I'm going to podcast. Um, well, let's see. David and I uh, have been together for almost 10 years, and we've been doing the podcast for uh, about two and a half now. And he was sitting with me. We were out on our driveway, and we were drinking, and I was actually feeling very frustrated because, you know, I, I have these other two book projects that I was feeling really uninspired about because I knew that even having a finished product just didn't necessarily mean people were going to be interested in it. And we were listening to the Bill Burr podcast. And nice. I'm a huge fan of Bill Burr. I'm a huge fan of stand-up that. comedy. He, he's the best. He's so cool. And I'm listening to his podcast and I'm like, huh, you know? maybe I could do this. It, it's not that different than, you know, what I've been doing anyway. It just, it's, it's telling stories. So, you know, I, I looked at David and I said, what do you think? And he's a musician, you know, he's got a huge background in production. So he said, you know what, we've got the gear, let's give it a shot. Awesome. Um, okay. So, on David, can you explain the importance of a producer and their duties? Well, for me, it's essential because David is very technical and I am not. So he really understands how to make the show sound good. You know, he's the one who hooked us up with a great microphone, uh, you know, with, with the correct production equipment. He knows how to, you know, connect to interviews for me and he really knows how to edit the podcast well. You know, he takes out breathing issues. He takes out all those weird ums and ahs and stutters. And he's also amazing at marketing. I mean, he, he really, he's the one who found Potter and Family. Um, he's the one who books all of the guests for the show. Uh, you know, he's, he's like the, the guy behind the curtain, making everything happen. Oh, Oz. Yeah, he is. Well, and it's great because it, it allows me to just focus on what I'm good at. And that's, you know, talking and telling wacky stories. And bourbon. Right, right. And bourbon. Yeah, and it lets bourbon. me drink. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, so you kind of went into a little bit on the day to day uh, struggles. It definitely is a day to day thing to crank out once a week. Um. How would you recommend a potential podcaster get started? Like, you know, I guess from the ground up, equipment, hosting, you know, outlining, gimmick, what? Well, what I can speak to is content because like I said, I'm not a technical person. So I, I don't, I can't talk about the gear. I don't know enough about it. But what I can say is that I think the best way to go about starting a podcast is to outline your first three episodes. You know, know what you're going to do, you know, have a concept. My problem, I think, was with my first couple of episodes, I just got on the microphone and I started babbling and <laughs> nobody wants to listen to babble. <laughs> you know, I, I, as, as fascinating as it sounds in your head, uh, you know, you, you kind of need to have a little bit of structure to podcasts. You know, you, you need to make sure that they're interesting and engaging. So I think that outlining your first three is going to be a big step towards getting to your next 10. You know, once, once you have that rhythm going, once you know what you're good at and what works, you know, you're already going to have that foundation in place. Okay. First three and then help you get to 10. I like that. I think, yeah, definitely being prepared sets you up for success. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, and podcasting is one of those things where, you know, as, as we'd said, there's so many of them. You need to find a way to stand out. And, you know, you're not going to stand out if you don't go in with a plan. True, true. It is kind of all about separating yourself from the group because it is so dense. Exactly. Okay. On to movies. Uh, last. What kind of movies do you like? And what are your favorite movies? I am a huge horror movie fan. I am all about the gore. Oh, there nice. we go. Oh. <laughs> Dude, you should put in the ding sound effect. Okay. Well, <laughs> ding. Got a winner. <laughs> all right. Okay, so, uh, so what are some of your favorite movies? 
Um, my favorite movies are probably the ones that came out of the seventies. I love the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, mm. I like Last House on the Left, uh, the original Hills Have Eyes, Rosemary's Baby. Um, I like the storytelling in all of them. Okay. Uh, but if I'm going to watch something just for like pure, raw, you know, mean spirit, um, <laughs> I love like like the guinea pig series, um, you know, just, just the, the really raw, like a uh, Serbian film, that kind of stuff. Oh. oh. Do you enjoy like those kind of slow burn suspense horrors, like uh, it comes at night, that kind of thing? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I I love it all. It, my my greatest despair in life is that I have yet to find a really good, you know, slow burn ghost movie. I feel like all of them now are just these, you know, over the top, you know, open the door, boo kind of movies, and I want to <laughs> see something that's just, you know, that that's just gonna scare the hell out of you without you even knowing it's coming. Hmm, that's true. That is more of the old style. Like Rosemary's Baby is definitely a slow burn. Yes, no yeah. Way. Dink, and then it's the cat. <laughs> right, yeah. I, I, that drives me crazy. You know, it's like, oh, come on. That wasn't scary. <laughs> <laughs> and loud noises. No, I, I like stuff that's going to mess with my head. Hmm. Well, yeah, story is definitely important. And I guess a lot of these mainstream ones kind of lack that. They just replace it with cool graphics, blood, and loud noises. Right. When, you know, and it, it's no, it, to me, it's not fun. You know, I, I, I want to see something different, something that's going to challenge me a little bit, you know? And, yeah. and there can be, you know, over the top gore effects. That's great. I think the last movie I saw, the last like new movie I saw that kind of surprised me was Hostel. And I know that sounds a little ridiculous, but it was the first time I'd gone to the movie theater in a long time, seen an original horror movie that did something a little different, but did it in a really like gross, but fun way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I actually surprisingly loved Hostel. You know, I saw it late. I saw it maybe a year or two after the buzz about it. And, it was just on TV, and I was like, okay, I'll check this out. And I was like, damn, I kind of actually like this movie. It was unexpected. It was. I actually cared about the characters, you know, that were getting <laughs> just tortured. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Although I, I'm so disappointed in Eli Roth now. I mean, I, I saw Green Inferno, and I was just so annoyed by it. He, he yeah, left like, out what? so much yeah, there was so much more he could have done with it. I felt like he totally copped out to get an R rating. He should have gone for an NC-17. Oh, wow. <laughs> nice. Oh. Green Inferno. Okay. Yeah, Eli Roth. Oh, no. And now he's doing, like, Death Wish. That's, like, a Oh, comedy. that's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boo. I don't boo. know. No. <laughs> yeah, I'm, so, I'm not excited. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I'm just going to pass on that until it's on Amazon Prime. Yeah, I think that's the only way to do it. So uh, what makes or breaks a film for you? Well, I I think, you know, the I guess my constant thread here, and if we were playing a drinking game, if we all took a drink when I said storytelling, Sorry. we'd be hammered right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it's got to be the story. It, it that's That's what drives it all. Uh, is it a lack of story or a shitty story that can kind of turn you off to it or both? Both, really, but I can handle a shitty story if it's original. If you were going to remake a good story and turn it into a shitty story so <laughs> you can, you know, d just throw in a certain actor or whatever it is, then, you know, you're going to lose me. <laughs> the fog. <laughs> Yes, right? You know, I, I don't want to see that. Oh, a big trouble in Little China. Why would you remake this movie? Yeah, why? Because it's so Dwayne the Johnson. can be in another $100 million <laughs> movie? Yeah, no. No, nobody will be better than Kurt Russell. Pork yep. Chop Express. Nobody will be better than the original, too. Like, why does that need to be remade? Anyway, we it could doesn't. It, three hours. <laughs> well, it, I know, like remaking Rosemary's Baby, why would you do this? 
Yeah, what what uh, new spin or like what is different now that needs to be adapted for modern times? Like, fuck, it still right. works. Exactly. It's not like CG reliant either. <laughs> no, that's just it because it's got that base of the great story. It did start as a book though, so I suppose that it has that advantage. True. They could have fucked it up though. I feel like a lot of books end up as fucking fucked up movies. No, that is true. <laughs> um, well, if I ask this next question, I feel like we'll be taking shots again. Uh, when a movie, <laughs> when a movie is bad, what do you feel makes it so? Are there common elements to shitty movies? I'll take story for a thousand. Yeah, I, I was trying to think of a different answer to that, and I, I don't know if I have one. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I could say something like, well, a bad actor or, you know, bad direction. But again, you know, if, if I'm not going to feel something for, you know, the way that it's done and what they're trying to get to, then, you know, I, I don't see the point. Hmm. Do you feel um, there are certain directors or even actors who can overcome a shitty story? That's an interesting question. Um, this probably won't be a popular answer, but I will say that Roman Polanski probably could. Mm. Because yeah, I, I think I'm... about what he's done with certain books, whether, you know, it's Rosemary's Baby or, you know, the source material for The Ninth Gate. Um, those were very straightforward stories, but he turned them into something more. So I would think he could take a story that wasn't quite as fully developed, and I think he could make it into something that was fascinating. Well, he is a pretty good director. Uh, despite myself, I actually like the pianist. That's kind of what I think. I know. Of Other than Rosemary's Baby, I think of, oh, Roman Polanski, the pianist, and everybody hates him. Well, he's not a popular guy, you know, and, and nor is Woody Allen. And I, I would have yeah. answered, Allen, except I've seen his last two movies and I hated them both. So <laughs> was that the one with Jesse Eisenberg and it takes place in like New York and then L.A. and then New York? Oh, I know what you're I don't talking know. about. I don't know, but it's hard to follow. I don't I like maybe three or four of his movies. I'm not like a huge fan of his. In fact, I think the movies that I like that are by him. I saw, and then, you know, at the end, it says directed by Woody Allen. I'm like, oh, really? I like the Woody Allen movie? Oh. Well, I'll tell you, the best movie he ever did is Midnight in Paris. You know, that one I have not seen. That's you have to see the newer movie. ones, though, like late 2000s. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. It came out about nine years ago, and, and it's amazing. It, it's actually, <laughs> it's such a cool story because it, it's originally based on a stand-up routine that he did, and we're talking way back in the 60s, where he talks about uh, what would happen if he was hanging out with Ernest Hemingway and, you know, with all the other writers of the time. And it turned into this movie where a writer is struggling with a book in Paris, and he just kind of slides back in time into the 20s, and all of a sudden he's hanging out with his literary heroes. Wow. Is that what that's about? That, that is that movie. Uh, Owen Wilson, isn't that? Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. That seems very different from the movies I'm used to him in. <laughs> it is. It's definitely very different. Uh, and it's amazing. It is a magical movie. All right. I will definitely check that out. When you say magical, do you mean like whimsical? Because I love whimsical movies. It's, it definitely has that spirit to it. Okay, cool. Well, lastly, and I've been waiting for this one. You are in talks with a production company to turn your stories into a web series. Can you tell us a little about that? I am indeed, yeah. Uh, we're in the very early stages of it, but we're working with a film company who wants to make a web series out of, initially we're thinking like five or six of um the more popular episodes of the podcast and, you know, have them, you know, acted out and turned into like little mini movies. And I'm blown away by the concept because it's so far beyond anything that I ever expected to happen with the podcast. Really? That sounds exciting as hell. Um, yeah. 
I know it's at the beginning stages, but uh, how involved will you be in the development and in the production? Well, I'd be involved in the initial script development. Now, I'm not a screenwriter. I don't know how to write for screen. It's not something that I'm very good at. So I would be de- be involved more in the concepting of the stories and the selecting of them. Um, we're still debating right now which ones we want to use. Our initial thought is, as I said, to maybe go with the, mo- the most popular episodes. But mm-hmm. I think, and and it's just something we're talking about. I don't know if this is going to happen or not, but I really think the character of Crazy Town that I have would make an excellent sort of through line for all of the stories. Um, it, it Again, I don't know where it's going to go, but I think there's a lot of potential there. That is so cool. And uh, by web series, um, do you know kind of how long they're thinking of each episode and uh, where it would air, like on a web network or youtube i have no idea well actually i do have some ideas i just can't say them <laughs> oh, okay. uh we're we're in talks with a couple different concepts and places where people you know can see them so you know fingers crossed again it's super super early in the process but um it, it would be amazing to see these stories really come to life hi hell yeah i am very stoked for that and We will keep tuned and kind of see uh, where it goes from there. And I think that's so awesome, man. Yeah, thank you. I'm I'm blown away and I'm so excited. Cool. Uh, Well, I guess before we wrap, is there anyone you want to shout out to or? Well, you know, I gave a lot of love to Potter and family. I love them. I think they are just the greatest collection of podcasts out there. Um, and again, I also want to uh, share some love for podcasts we listen to. It's a Facebook group. It's just a collection of podcast fans, and they hang out. They talk about their favorite podcasts. And I've learned about so many cool shows through there. Um, and they're the ones who are hosting the Potter and Love Convention. So just a great group of people. Great. That sounds exciting. Okay. Well, thank you very much for yeah. joining us. Thank was, you, Julia. It was Appreciate so it. Awesome for you. Of course. Julia. I've had a great time talking with you guys. Thanks for having me. No problem. It's kind of been a long time coming. I'm thank I'm thankful you had this little break. I know. <laughs> We've been talking about this what for like six, seven months, something like that. Something yeah. like that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, I'm so glad it finally came together. For sure. Yeah, me too. <laughs> thank you very much. Of course. Okay. Yeah. I'll Extend our thanks and props to David. All right, we'll have a cool. great rest of your night, Juliet. Have a great night. Enjoy that oh, bourbon thanks. lemon thing. And the bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, the lemon thing. I will. I hope you guys have a great night, too. All right, thanks. We will. Good night. Bye. Good night. This is a Echo Media Podcast.